All right, guys, so in this video, we're going to be covering the pancreas as a potential cause of right upper quadrant abdominal pain, as well as mid-epigastric pain. Um, so let's talk about pancreatic inflammation, also known as pancreatitis. We're going to split this up into an acute pancreatitis and a chronic one. Um, starting off with acute pancreatitis, we have our two main culprits for this, which are alcohol and gallstones. So alcohol increases zymogen production in the pancreas. Those are our precursor digestive protein enzymes that are going to go into the duodenum. So those are increased and then bicarbonate production is decreased. So what that causes is really viscous fluid within the system. They form little protein plugs because zymogens are proteins and that causes gunk to build up. So the zymogens build up in the ace, ace in our cells in our cell region and we have activation of the zymogen and pancreatic autodigestion. Next we have gallstones. So gallstones can also block uh, the exit of uh, pancreatic excretions. So let's say we have a gallstone near the common bile duct and the ampulla of Vader. It's going to block up our pancreatic duct and now we have backup of zymogens in the system which will eventually self-activate and begin digesting the pancreas. So what we just discussed are biliary pancreatitis, which is caused by our gallstones, and alcohol-induced pancreatitis. Now, if we look at the incidence for these, biliary pancreatitis is more common than alcoholic. So if you're just going epidemiologically, uh, primary suspect is a gallstone. And how are we going to remove that? Potentially ERCP, like we discussed in our gallbladder video. So let's talk about some other culprits for acute pancreatitis. Uh, hypertriglyceridemia and hypercalcemia are two other main culprits from things in the blood. ERCP uh, can damage the biliary tract and can cause blockages, so strictures and things like that after healing or inflammation even. Then there are drugs we have to consider, so steroids, azathioprine, so that's a cancer drug, sulfonamides, antibiotics and things like that, furosemide, um, diuretic, estrogen, and we have protease inhibitors, and NRTIs, which are HIV drugs. So in your HIV patients, you got to be aware that acute pancreatitis could be a, uh, as a result of their medications. Then we have scorpion stings, which is a, is a little bit more exotic um, for some patients that own, own scorpions. Maybe this is a key differential question if acute pancreatitis is on your differential. Um, then we have viral infections. So Coxsackie B and mumps are two main viruses to consider here. Trauma. So these, this is not really from blunt trauma. It's mostly stab wounds, penetrating trauma that gets to the pancreas, uh, causing disruptions in circulation and flow. Then we have autoimmune disorders, which you can consider. So Sjogren's syndrome, right? This is a disease that's going to affect secretory cells. We're going to get really viscous fluid. What's another disease that causes viscous buildup? cystic fibrosis, right? So here's, here we connect the dots between hereditary and autoimmune uh, diseases, both of them causing viscous buildup, both of them potentially causing pancreatitis. And another congenital thing is pancreatic pancreas divism. So if you're born with this congenital deformity, you have an increased risk for pancreatitis. Then we have uh, some sequelae of our condition. So we have capillary leak and hypocalcemia. Now what happens is the pancreas is now inflamed, all these inflammatory cytokines are being released into the blood, and that causes vasodilation and distributive shock. Hypocalcemia is as a result of the uh, autodigestion of the pancreas, as well as lipases being released in the pancreatic region. These lipases break down fats and triglycerides, then will bind, bind calcium, causing low calcium in the blood, or hypocalcemia. And in these patients, you'll see tetany, spasms, seizures, arrhythmias. So this is a very dangerous complication as well. So we're going to get shock and hypocalcemia as our main complications of acute pancreatitis. So we have some tests that we run if we suspect this uh, is the case in our patient. We have serum pancreatic enzymes. And here we're really looking at lipase. If lipase is three times the upper reference range, then we have a clear indicator that this is pancreatitis. Amylase is not as specific. So if you had to pick one, uh, I, would, I would pick lipase over amylase. And just to be clear that these enzyme levels are not prognostic. So although you can have an elevation three times, four times, five times, the elevation is not indicative of prognostic outcomes. So this is just a general indicator of whether or not you do have a pancre pancreatic involvement. Um, then we have a test to assess our severity of our disease. So we detected it and now we're assessing severity. 
hematocrit is important here and what's key is that hematocrit can either go up or down now it's more severe if hematocrit's going down but let's talk about up first so increased hemo concentration because of third spacing of our fluids so remember that our capillary leak is going on uh, all of the fluid in our plasma is moving into our third space or our uh, interstitial compartments and now we're having increased hematocrit just as a result of concentration not really increased blood production and then we have decreased hematocrit if our pancreas is becoming hemorrhagic so either that's so much di auto digestion of the pancreas that it's bleeding a lot or because of some penetrating trauma that caused the pancreatitis in the first place so out of these decreased hematocrit is a lot more critical and you're going to need to watch out for these patients going uh, uh, decompensating rapidly then we have increased white blood cell count which is a marker of inflammation uh, blood urea nitrogen is going to go up and why is that because of our third spacing our kidneys aren't getting perfused as well right so BUN is an important marker for pancreatitis as well then increased CRP and procalcitonin levels these are in indicators of inflammation on top of our white blood cell count that's gone up uh, and again white blood cell count can also indicate infection that could be causing this so now we have our diagnostic tests we have ALKFOS and bilirubin levels which we talked about serum calcium levels and we have triglyceride levels so what you're looking for with the ALKFOS and bilirubin is evidence of gallstone pancreatitis right so our gallstone is blocking our biliary system that's going to cause ALKFOS and bilirubin to go up so that's going to indicate our gallstone pancreatitis then serum calcium levels are going to indicate if your hypercalcemia is a result of your pancreatitis so that's uh, kind of funny right how high calcium can lead to low calcium in this case because our hypercalcemia causes our pancreatitis all the calcium gets bind up by the uh, triglycerides that are floating around as a result of the lipase overproduction and now we have low calcium levels and then we have serum triglyceride levels so hypertriglyceridemia is an indicator for or for a etiology of pancreatitis so look out for those levels as well then how do we treat this so um, pancreatitis is really a fluid disease so fluid resuscitation has to be aggressive and usually it's done with lactated ringers or normal saline I know in my hospital they use lactated ringers uh, for fluid resuscitation because all of that's third spacing we have to compensate by putting blood back into the circulatory system um, and that's usually done with fluids and then we have analgesia so this person is usually in a lot of pain and fentanyl is or other IV opioids are the go-to here and bowel rests so we put the person on NPO so nothing per oral nothing per mouth until the pain begins to subside and then gradually reintroduce food next we have complications of acute pancreatitis so that's our abscesses and our pseudocysts which can result are usually a result of the inflammation going on in the area abscess from bacteria and entering the inflamed and infected area which is now structurally compromised um, then we have SIRS and sepsis and DIC so you can go into septic shock if the bacteria from the gut are now able to enter the peritoneal region and the auto digestion of the pancreas really causes a lot of irritation and maybe potential perforation of that area then we have pneumonia so one thing you really look out for is within an episode of acute pancreatitis is ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome and this is a result of the pancreas releasing all these inflammatory cytokines they're now traveling to the lungs causing inflammation in the lungs and now you're having uh, respiratory distress as a result of that distributive shock as we talked about before and volume depletion as well as hypocalcemia which we also talked about before so if we have recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis uh, that can lead to chronic pancreatitis and those are our alcohol abusers who will not stop drinking those are the people who uh, recurrently use tobacco so tobacco is a risk factor for that as well as people who get recurrent stones or trauma to the pancreas so stones will cause biliary obstruction as we talked about in the acute case and then trauma uh, can be severe too if let's say you have multiple penetrating injuries for example then let the pancreas has two main functions so it's either exocrine or endocrine and both of these are going to be uh, inhibited in chronic pancreatitis cases we have our exocrine function so the person is no longer producing adequate lipase amylase and protease and as a result of that we're going to have maldigestion steatorrhea or fatty stools and malabsorption of carbohydrate and protein products so that's our exocrine function and then our endocrine function is the beta cells no longer work so we're going to have pancreat 
pancreatic diabetes. These people are eventually going to require insulin. What do we do to treat these people? So we tell them to stop using alcohol and nicotine. Then we have small regular meals so that the pancreas isn't overloaded. And we can also supplement with medium chain triglycerides so that the lipases don't need to work as hard. We also have uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement. So these are little capsules of pancreatic enzyme the person can take and they will help digest the meals for them. And we have supplementation of our fat soluble vitamins. Remember our lipases aren't working anymore so fat soluble vitamins aren't gonna be as easily absorbed. And for the pancreatic diabetics, if it gets bad enough, we'll need to give them insulin. Then for pain management, uh, NSAIDs and opioids work in these patients, or if it's refractory pain, a celiac ganglion block can also be done. An important note here is that late stage pancreatitis can be painless. So uh, just watch out for that. The person might not have any right upper quadrant or mid gastric pain if they're having uh, chronic pancreatitis. Complications of our chronic pancreatitis, so pseudocysts, just as we talked about in the acute cases. But this, in these cases, the cysts are generally a little bit larger. They can cause gastric outlet obstruction and bilious vomiting because of the obstruction. Um, then we also have splenic vein thrombosis. The splenic vein runs really close to the pancreas, and the inflammation can induce a thrombus to form and cause splenic complications. And we also have pancreatic ascites. So we talked about third spacing in the acute case. And this is just a chronic third spacing in the pancreatic area. So the person's going to build a fluid in their peritoneal cavity. All right, so that was a quick overview on the pancreas, uh, how it can cause some abdominal pain, either in the right upper quadrant or the mid-epigastric region. I hope this video was helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.